from the Bavaria of America. Thank you. <laughs> oh. No, it's it it, it is a, it it's a, it's an honor to be here. Um, I think the theme of uh, this this uh, uh, of the of the event is um, dare to know. I'm going to dare to present without slides. I'm going to dare to present about generative AI after Bjorn, like because stable diffusion is amazing, right? But I, I do want to talk a little bit about what the implications of these technologies are for business and draw on some of the research that we've been doing, but also try to make it quite real for the people in this room and, and the businesses that you represent. So uh, again, Stephanie, we've, we've been studying AI and other disruptive technologies uh, for quite some time. Um, and certainly, you know, just a few months before uh, the last DLD, you know, so something quite remarkable had happened. Bjorn had been working on this before, but for most of us, we didn't actually have the, you know, the, the experience of using generative AI until Gosh, it feels like it's been five years, right? But it's only been a matter of months since we've all started using this stuff. What we try to do is understand where the potential is for a business. And so we looked at dozens of different potential use cases of generative AI across all sectors, across the entire global economy, and across all functions in the business. And what was interesting about it, while it has the potential to basically affect all parts of the business, every industry, there are some concentrations in which these technologies, the generative AI technologies particularly, can have the most impact. In fact, if you look at the potential impact on an annual basis, it could be as much as 2.6 to 4.4 trillion US dollars on an annual basis. That's profit potential. Now, a lot of that gets competed away, and you know, we all benefit from it. We don't necessarily pay for it all, but that's what's possible. But 75% of that value comes in four areas. So number one, marketing and sales. You know, Bjorn talked about it, right? It, it, whether it's one-to-one -one individualized marketing or whether it's brand, I mean, at some point you'll be able to issue a prompt and it will create the video, the ad copy, the voice, the music, the images for an entire ad campaign. We're not there yet, but it's clearly moving that direction. But also one-to-one -one marketing, whether it's a personalized marketing offer, those things are coming. So marketing and sales. Secondly, as Bjorn was talking about as well, software development. And you, know, you might know this phrase, software is eating the world, right? It isn't just companies around San Francisco and necessarily Bavaria who now are writing software, right? Every company now is a software company. And so if everyone has developers and we're doing experiments with our own software developers and we're seeing double digit increases in their productivity from 10 to 70%, 70, 70% 70 depending on the task, when you can actually just ask code to be written, you do have to debug it afterwards. But that is a remarkable thing and has a huge amount of impact. Thirdly, customer operations. Again, if the thing is a chatbot, that makes sense, right? This ability to have a, a virtual subject matter expert that can answer questions, have a dialogue about your products, you know, or, or you know, whatever it is, or internally, right? Whether it's HR or what have you, that's powerful. Those three, kind of obvious. The fourth one, I really want to emphasize, and I think we don't understand this well enough, but the potential is really there. You might hear this term large language model, right? Because you know the foundation models on, on which this technology is trained often work on language, and that's remarkable, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But you know, the input, the prompts being in language and the outputs being in language is interesting. By the way, the outputs, you know, being a computer language, okay, large language model, that makes sense. But if you think about stable diffusion, if you think about a whole bunch of these other models that can be generated, the unstructured data doesn't have to be language. And so if you start to think about R&D in your companies, you can enter a prompt and have it produce a drug candidate. You can enter a prompt and have it produce uh, a draft of an electrical circuit. Enter a prompt, have it design a car. And so I think the most under-recognized, and it's implied in the name generative AI, the generation. But I think where we don't understand well enough, but where there's great under-recognized potential, is using these technologies in R&D. And what we size was just the productivity increases. That doesn't even include how much more innovation you can get. So I think there's a lot of real potential there. It's under-recognized, and there's a lot of potential for moving forward, and to be honest, competitive advantage. Second, let me talk a little bit about the, about the labor force uh, and the workforce implications of these technologies. 
I mean, uh, you know, one way to think about it is these technologies give you superpowers, right? They, right, if they can create more candidates, more ideas for you, if it can save you time, that's incredibly powerful, right? And so we do think that it, from a labor market standpoint, from the individual worker, if you learn how to use these technologies earlier, faster, better, you, you will, you know, have a competitive advantage in the labor market. I'm going to come back to this question about jobs and all those things as well. In fact, what we've found, uh, you know, again, we have this micro to macro methodology. We looked at not only every occupation in the world, but all of the constituent activities within every occupation. Because generally, technology doesn't, you know, like I enjoy science fiction too, but generally, you know, someone doesn't just leave the stage and then, you know, in comes C3PO or something like that and does everything that you might do in your job. It's usually pieces of your job. So that was the level of analysis that we looked at. And basically what we discovered was generative AI, and then let me just throw this in with all the other types of technology which exist, robotics, AI before generative AI, right? That all was on a path to having a huge amount of impact already. But generative AI has basically increased the pace at which that could happen by about 10 years. And why is that? Because when we looked at, you know, the people who are working on natural language, they thought the ability to understand natural language at a median human level probably, you know, there was a range, right? But call it in the 2040s. But now it roughly is today. Now, you know, that's, that's more like 20 years, but it, when you model out how long it takes for technology to be adopted, you look at things moving in about a decade. And that's remarkable. Roughly 25% of the hours that we pay people to work require a median level of human understanding of natural, of, of natural language. And so that is what's accelerated it. And the slightly weird thing about this technology, too, or unique thing about this technology, I don't know if there are labor economists in the room, right? But there's this, this term called skills bias technological change. In other words, heretofore, most of the technologies that would automate human work typically would mostly affect the people who had the lowest, or the occupations that had the lowest levels of educational requirements and that we paid the least for, the lowest wage occupations. That's skill bias technological change. When we analyzed the potential of generative AI, it was almost the exact opposite. It was the roles that we paid the most for, managers, physicians, attorneys, and it was the people that had the highest requirements for educational attainment to do those occupations, engineers, where this technology has the greatest potential. Now, it's, it's you know, two sides of a coin. One is it gives people superpowers. The other way to think about it is it automates some of the work that those people do. Those are actually two different ways of thinking about it, and that happens. But when we combine generative AI with all the other potential technologies that can automate hours of work, in countries like Germany and the United States, by 2030, about 30% of the hours that we pay people to work today, potentially in the, in the middle of our range of scenarios, could be automated by 2030. And that's a huge number. It also isn't unprecedented in history. We've been able to you know, automate this type of work, get the productivity increases, and also redeploy that labor. But it takes work to do that. It takes a lot of reskilling, all those sorts of things. So, you know, that real potential is there for our workforce, but it will require a lot of work to make sure that we can actually capture that value and then redeploy labor. And then, of course, you have to worry about, you know, our, you know what does that mean for wages? But again, to this point about dare to be optimistic, we, we really, really do need to increase productivity. About half of the economic growth we've exhibited or we've benefited from in the past half century has come about because of more people working, right? Population increasing, more women in the workforce, we're living longer and working longer, and about half of it because of increases in productivity, deploying technologies, whether it's AI or robotics or, you know, advanced communications, all those sorts of things. Is the German workforce increasing or decreasing in size? Decreasing. Is the Chinese workforce increasing or decreasing in size? Italy, Spain, the United States only because of immigration is slightly increasing. So we're losing, about to lose half of the sources of our economic growth in the next half century. So we badly need to accelerate productivity growth. 
increase the quality and volume of things that we produce for every day we work at work. And so we need this technology. I'm a little bit worried that we won't deploy it fast enough, but we also need to keep people working as we do that. Now, with that said, it is easy to focus only on one technology. You'll note that the, things, the research findings I just described were not just generative AI, but generative AI with other technologies as well. You, uh, let, let me just remind you that this 2.6 to 4.4 trillion that I mentioned before, there is actually even more potential value for our businesses from all the AI that was not generative. You know, call it analytics, analytical AI, or you know, analytics on steroids, big data. All that stuff hasn't gone, all that potential hasn't gone away either. So whether it's you know, next product to buy recommendations, you know, reducing unplanned downtime you know, in, your, in your manufacturing, optimizing your logistics, all of that is valuable too. Now, the nice thing is that you know, now everyone has heard of generative AI, you can have a conversation about all the rest. But in general, what we're going to see is systems that combine techno different technologies, right? And so Steffi mentioned some other ones as well, right? So whether it's you know, advanced uh, connectivity, Internet of Things, immersive technologies, you know, again, there'll be lots of presentations about all these topics going forward. Quantum being an enabler for certain types of uh, technologies as well. All of those things put together is how you actually solve problems, and that's incredibly important. And let me just finish. We do have, and again, you know, I dare to be an optimist, we do have real problems we need to solve, right? Whether it's the energy transition, right? Whether it is spreading prosperity and having a more sustainable, inclusive growth. These technologies have the potential to do that. But, it, you know, when you talk about what's going to happen, right? I, like, as a researcher, I often say, I don't study the laws of physics. The reason we have these large ranges around the scenarios is because what happens is going to be the result of choices that we make, choices that people in this room will make. And so, I, again, I encourage you to, you know, soak in the technology. It's really fun stuff, too. But also think about what can you do to, to actually make this stuff have the most impact. Thank you.